Welcome to Wildly Wealthy Life, the show that's all about exploring the different paths to a life of freedom and fulfillment and how that ripples through your personal life, family life, and to the community. Join husband and wife power couple Lee and Kat Hughes as they share people's stories from different backgrounds and lifestyles about what it means to live a life well lived. Tune in and take that first step to becoming the best version of yourself, personally and professionally, here on Wildly Wealthy Life. Wealth is just the ability to have choices. I mean, it's not necessarily having all the money in the world because there's also the phrase more money, more problems. But Mm -hmm. wealth is about just having the ability to make the choices Mm -hmm. that you want to make. It's the decision to stay at home or the decision to work at a job you really love. It's the decision to go into the middle of nowhere and to live the lifestyle that you want, or it's choosing to be in the middle of the city that you absolutely love. And all I wanted was control over my time. I wanted to be able to do things with my time under my control, and I wanted to stop trading what they say in your money of your life, Vicki Robbins writes, trading life energy for money. Don't have to do that anymore. And welcome to another episode of Wildly Wealthy Life. My name is Lee, and here to my left is my lovely wife, Kat. Kat, mm-hmm. who do we have on today? Today we have Doug Nordman and his uh, daughter, Carol. Doug served for over 20 years of active duty in the U.S. Navy's submarine force and retired in 2002 at the age of 41. Him and his spouse actually reached financial independence in the late 1999 on a high savings rate, and they have lived financially independent since then. They've lived in Hawaii for over 30 years where they raised uh, their daughter, Carol. And Carol, who is also with us today, is uh, also a part of the Navy. And her and her dad, Doug, is both the author of The Military Guide to Financial Independence and Retirement. And both Carol and Doug are the authors of Raising Your Money Savvy Family for Next Generation Financial Independence. What I love, too, is that Doug actually donates all of his writing and speaking revenue to military-friendly charities. So really looking forward to chat with him today. And Doug and Carol, how are you guys today? It's uh, good to be here, and it's great to start out a new podcast this way. I really enjoy these early episodes. <laughs> Same here. Now, you guys, I mean, you're not in Oahu right now, but you're usually, you, live, you guys live in Hawaii, but you guys are in Monterey right now, which is, I guess, not that, that early. Um, can you guys uh, tell us a little bit more about what you guys do? Um, how, what did you do? I mean, it's, I'm sure it's a very long story, but what did you do to uh, get to be financially independent, and, and what are you doing now? The short story is high savings rate. We uh, started our Navy careers in the 80s, Margin I, uh, and served through the 90s. And back then, financial independence wasn't really something that was mainstream. Uh, we didn't have the 4% safe withdrawal rate. We didn't have the Trinity study. It wasn't until that book came out in 1993, Your Money or Your Life, that it really started to get some attention. And, and even back then, it wasn't regarded as a, a classic that's going to sell 100,000 copies. Back then, it was just a kind of a hippie, granola, carefree, surfer dude lifestyle that uh, really made a lot of people feel skeptical. So we were aware that we could save uh, a lot of money in, in our lifestyle and that would lead us to maybe be able to not work after we left the Navy. We didn't have any big ambitions or plans beyond that. But that high savings rate paid off when we started our family. Uh, our careers up to that point had been you know, challenging, fulfilling, uh, fun, not necessarily fun all the time, but uh, worth doing. Uh, once we started a family, we wanted to spend more time with our daughter, of course, and uh, that okay. turned out to be not always what the Navy needed from us. And so there's that inherent conflict of wanting to spend more time with family. And that led to us to start pursuing financial independence, especially your money, your life. And then in 1996, The Millionaire Next Door came out and we started digging into it. And I talk about reaching financial independence in 1999. And I joke that back then, anybody who invested in the stock market and the internet at that year reached financial independence briefly. (laughs) Uh, But I I retired from active duty in 2002. And that's when we really started our our second life uh, when we stopped working for paychecks. Wow, that's amazing. And uh, Carol, I just wanted to kind of uh, get your, um, you know, take on this. Like, what is it like being able to uh, be aware about how to be money savvy and all that financial independence, <laughs> all that stuff, you know, um, at your age? And that's the thing is that when you're growing up with money savvy parents, you don't really think about what kind of situation you're in. It's your parents and that's really all you know. And it's not 
until you're into your 20s, I'm 27 now, that you start to realize what a difference it is. You know, you talk about all those graphs where you have your low savings rate and your high savings rate, and it feels the same way when it comes to lifestyle. It feels like I'm on a different plane than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until we got into our 20s, me and my peers, of course, that you start to see those differences. You start to see that I'm living debt free. I'm living basically at buy, and I still have friends that are taking extra bonuses at work, working long hours that are just trying to, to keep that paycheck rolling for them. How does that affect how you relate to them? You know, because I guess, especially when, you know, when at a young age and your your parents have, have ingrained this in you and you're also living that kind of lifestyle, and then you have friends that maybe are not there, you know, how do you relate to them where they don't feel left out or you don't feel left out and, and you know, um, yeah, just talk about that experience. There's not really a way to, you know, money is still very much a taboo topic. It's not something that's come into the mainstream. We spend a lot of time with financial groups and FI groups. And so for those groups of people, it's pretty straightforward. Everybody talks about money. But when it comes to your friends outside of money, no one really talks about it. And mm -hmm. so everyone that <clears throat> is my friend, they accept that I'm just weird. They, they know that there's a lot of things about me that are just weird. And they right. accept that, oh, she's got this weird money thing going on. That's why she's at home all day. And we just go from there. Awesome. I love that. That's amazing. That's really cool. Yeah. And uh, that's when you know you need new friends. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It's cool because you, you can kind of see, well, these are, you know, you have your friends, but then you have your friends that you really grow with because you guys have the same mindset exactly. and, and lifestyle. And, and I think that in that sense, you know, even at a young age, you actually get to grow further. You have like bigger dreams and goals just because you have a different circle of friends, which is, which is awesome. And what I like is uh, this generational... Uh, wisdom we're getting here between both father and daughter. This is awesome. Uh, how there's, there's some selection bias here. This one works. Bit, so yeah, yeah we'll, we'll talk about it. <laughs> it doesn't always work that, that nice. well, right? <laughs> sorry, sorry. But uh, my question is from both of your different perspectives, could you both take a minute and for our listeners define like what a wildly wealthy life is and, and or just what wealth is to each of you individually? Well, wealth is just the ability to have choices. I mean, it's not necessarily having all the money in the world because there's also the phrase more money, more problems. But mm -hmm. wealth is about just having the ability to make the choices that you want to make. It's the decision to stay at home or the decision to work at a job you really love. It's the decision to go into the middle of nowhere and to live the lifestyle that you want, or it's choosing to be in the middle of the city that you absolutely love. Mm -hmm. And all I wanted was control over my time. I wanted to be able to do things with my time under my control. And I wanted to stop trading what they say in your money or your life. Vicki Robbins writes, trading life energy for money. Don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I love that book. I read that book too. It's it's pretty awesome. Actually, it's funny because I had just read about that book recently, but you know, it's in the time that it was released, it was, and now I'm understanding the more that I look into it, that when it was released at that time, it's probably one of those, what is this kind of lifestyle? Because not everybody really yes. talks about it. Um, but I love that you got a hold of it. And, and instead of saying, you know, instead of kind of looking at it as, uh, what is this? You actually dove into it and kind of applied the things that you've learned, and now you're you're living you're living that financially independent life. I want to kind of touch on when you said you know you were living uh, financially independent briefly in 1999, and then in, in <laughs> 2000s was when you started like your second life. What was what did that look like, and what was that second life like as far as um, pursuing financial independence? We, we reached financial independence in 1999, but we didn't understand that at the time. We didn't have the 4% safe withdrawal rate knowledge that we have now. We just knew that we had what looked like enough. Um, at that point in my life, uh, 2000, 2001, I was working at uh, shore duty at a Navy training command. Life was good. It did not suck. And so by that point, near 20 years, uh, it was easier to stay on active duty and serve out until the pension the military gives you after you reach 20 years of active duty. In, in retrospect, with what I know today, uh, we way overshot the mark. We had saved enough in our careers to be able to reach financial independence without that pension and without most of the military benefits that we have. And so by staying till 20, I actually made a mistake, uh, worked longer than I needed to, but again, we didn't have those tools available in the 1990s, and it was in 1999, in retrospect, around 2001, that I realized, hey, we've been here for a while. That let us go much more confidently into retirement, into military retirement. Once we stopped working for a paycheck, 
we went through all the things that people do with a transition from one career to another. In the military, you're always going to leave the military someday. You always have that transition to, to work toward and to think about. And, and we made that transition with the additional issue that we wouldn't be going after a paycheck. And that caused a lot of concern from friends and family. And uh, probably the only person who wasn't worried was Carol. Carol's impression of financial independence was mom and dad would have more time to spend with Carol. And so <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. yeah that, that was, that's what we want. <laughs> yeah. So we essentially, you stop going to work, but you still have to retire. You still have to reach FI and move towards something. You can't just run away from your job and hope to go sit somewhere in a cabin in the woods or in a van down by the river and, and be able to decompress and start a new life. You have to have interests, hobbies, uh, a to-do list at, to, to work toward. Now, that's not the same pace of life that you were living when you were working for a paycheck, but you still have to figure out what your life is going to look like after the transition. Uh, the story we tell is that we took surfing lessons on the very first day of retirement. The, the joke was, what are you going to do? Surf all day? Nobody can do that. And maybe not now, maybe I'd need a recovery day, but at the time we wanted to find out more about this surfing lifestyle. We took lessons and uh, I think it's fair to say we were hooked, right? Yeah. Line and sinker, yes. Yeah, it took about 10 minutes to say, yeah, this is what we want to do. So we found right away one of the hobbies that consumed a good portion of our time. And, and since then, it's been finding other things that we enjoy doing. Uh, I guess it's probably a big surprise now that uh, I like to write and Carol likes to write too. But that was another interest I never really had pursued when I was on active duty. And mm -hmm. so you just find those other things. You keep exploring different areas of life that you've never had a chance to look at. It's a chance really to do life version 2.0. Yeah. Wow. Now, going back a little bit farther, too, because I know you spent quite a bit of time in a couple of different uh, boats, a couple of different subs, and I know those uh, missions aren't like a week out at sea. They're usually, <laughs> usually uh, <laughs> you're, you're away for, for quite a bit. Um, do, you, do you remember any of this, any of these thoughts while you were, you were away? Were you, were you writing, journaling, or how, I don't know if any of that kind of bled into what you do now or what set you up for financial independence at all? We're, we're, we're both experienced on submarines. I, I don't know if we've told anybody about this, but Carol's uh, wearing my ballistic missile deterrent patrol pin for the work she did as a midshipman getting uh, her Navy commission. But uh, we both spent the time on the submarines. And uh, back then you would sit around and talk about what you're going to do when you get off this boat, uh, what you're going to do when you're anywhere else than right here right now. And even back then, uh, we had a high savings rate, and we were pretty focused on financial independence. And to us, it was, we're going to earn as much money as we can and save as much money as we can. And when we get out of the military, we're going to live life on our terms. I didn't realistically expect that it would mean never working for another paycheck again. I thought back then that I would be working at another job, either part-time or it's something I enjoyed doing for you know five or 10 years. And it turned out that the finances, by the time we got to that point, were good enough that we didn't have to. And today, again, we overshot the mark. And today the finances are better than they've ever been. We have more than enough assets to live the rest of our lives in financial independence. Wow. And I, I have to add on a comment to that. You know, you did a lot of your time on submarines. That was your main billet. But for me, it was all about surface ships. I spent my time on a destroyer and an aircraft carrier for my first and second tour. And the reality is that as, as nice as the movies make it seem, there's really not a lot of time. Uh, especially when you're trying to, you know, you talk about talking about what you're going to do off that boat. That's because you're already trapped in a watch floor. You're already standing there for six hours or eight hours or however long it is. And you really have run out of things to talk about until the next emergency comes up. And so you start talking about why. But yeah. when you are underway and you're taking care of the ship and you are taking care of your sailors and you're trying to get your sleep and your workout and your meals in, there's no time. And so it's very easy to put your savings on autopilot. It's very easy to have your auto uh, deduction, your auto deposits from your paycheck directly into your investment account. And it just all works while you're underway. Now, one thing I have a question, because my, my brother served for about eight years in the Army and he was over in the, the big sandbox in nice. the east there for a while. But um, he... In terms of like finding uh, training for money and handling of money like that was kind of non-existent for, for, you know, his time. Uh, it was the opposite actually, where he just spent pretty much everything that he had. And I hear that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm curious um, for any of the veterans that are listening as well, or people that are in service right now, um, what, what kind of tips, what kind of 
um, suggestions would you have for them to find, you know, more education, more training, um, just some experiential things uh, that they could do to, you know, better their situation, better their savings and get prepared for that departure? There, there's a big push now in the military. We've always focused on financial responsibility. Don't sell your secrets to the enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've never really focused on financial literacy. Uh, we've talked about making the transition to starting a second career as a civilian, getting a really good job, and then you'll figure out all your finances after that. Yeah. Uh, and we're finally in the Department of Defense getting to the point where we're starting to begin to focus on financial literacy. And all the veterans that are listening to this podcast are laughing sarcastically as I say that because they know the reality is that nobody is making this happen unless it's important to them and, and they have the time to do it. I'd say financial literacy is on the radar, but it's one of the lowest priorities of the Department of Defense. Realistically, though, Military families, active duty, reserve, National Guard, and, and their families have the opportunity to go onto a military base and go to any family service center, family support center, and find the financial counselors there. Yeah. And they're like coaches. They're accredited financial counselors. They might be certified financial planners. Their whole job is to help you learn the basics, how to set a budget, how to build your savings rate, how to pay off debt, how to do the basics of financial literacy. They're not they're not necessarily going to be able to tell you how much life insurance you should buy or how you should set up your will or do your estate planning, but they will tell you how to get out of debt and get on the right track to financial independence. So the very first step, if anybody wants that kind of help is to go to the base, find the financial support center and talk to somebody. And that's probably the way it's been for you over the last few years, right? You've been sending a lot of people there. Oh, definitely. So yeah. for uh, the beginning of my career, I had a, a bit of a lull period where I actually went over to something called the Navy Marine Corps. Oh Relief. yeah. Society and uh, Navy Marine Corps Relief. It's actually it started as a nonprofit outside of the service, and it was designed to to help the the widows and orphans of sailors. But it's morphed into one of the main financial uh, literacy resources for the military. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about Navy Marine Corps Relief is that they have a program where they can give uh, small loans to sailors that are having issues. And so here I am, you know, just a volunteer for overshadowing a couple of days, and I'm learning about all kinds of situations that sailors run into. And it's everything as simple as we just moved and our paychecks haven't quite aligned themselves yet and we need some help covering this month's groceries. Or it's things more complex like I have four cars and three houses and I can't figure out how to control my cash flow and I need to be able to make the rent next month. Mm -hmm. And so you, I, I had that particular experience. I was lucky that I had the, the people around me like my dad and friends of my dad to, to show me those kinds of resources but for the other ensigns that were like me, no one really knew about it. You, you got that one line blurb in your training that said, and if your sailor runs into financial issues, take the Navy Marine Corps relief. <laughs> and, and that was pretty much it. <laughs> wow. That's really some real life experience that opened a few eyeballs. Huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you mentioned earlier, you said, oh, um, go in a van and sit by the river. Did that actually happen? <laughs> No. <laughs> it was very specific. I was like, that actually happened. <laughs> um, There's sparkly humor there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I do want to go back a little bit just for our listeners who are not very familiar about this whole financial independence movement. What do you mean when you say 4% uh, savings, uh, safe withdrawals? And can you also talk about when you said that now you have enough assets that can sustain you? What are those assets that you've put into that is uh, allowing you this financial independence? I'll start with a 4% safe withdrawal rate. It's a computer simulation that looked at historical American stock market performance and tried to figure out how your money would survive and what your withdrawal rate could be if you went through history. So it just runs a bunch of simulations. You start with say a million dollars and you figure out how long that portfolio lasts if you retired in 1926 or 1929 at the start of the Great Depression or 1966, all those periods through history and it watched how your withdrawal rates survived and for how long the money lasted. What we've found out is that by running that simulation over and over and over again, that generally if your withdrawal rate was 4% or less, that you would have a portfolio that was almost guaranteed to last for 30 years. I'm using some weasel words here like almost and practically. Mm -hmm. And what that means is it's all probabilities. It's a computer study and it depends on history, but it can't model everything and a number of simplifying assumptions were made. Today, the 4% safe withdrawal rate has been validated and reproduced and everybody agrees that 4% is a pretty reasonable starting point. And I like to use the analogy of a tripwire. 
If you have a $40,000 a year spending expense lifestyle and you save a million dollars, then you're ready to live off that million dollars at the 4% safe withdrawal rate of $40,000 a year. And when we say the 4% safe withdrawal rate, what we really mean is you start out the very first day you're financially independent, you withdraw that 4%. But then after that, your 4% goes up each year, uh, a new withdrawal at the rate of inflation. So even though you started at 4%, you're not taking out 4% every year for the rest of your life. You're taking out 4% and hypothetically, you're raising that every year for inflation. Pretty much guaranteed to last for 30 years. However, there have been failures. So I talk with people about how the failures can be worked out, how you can deal with it. It turns out that the study did not include social security. And one of the ways to guard against failures of the safe withdrawal rate is to have an annuity. And if you have an annuity for the rest of your life, longevity insurance, that makes the 4% safe withdrawal rate guaranteed to work, even if you come into it later on in life. So if you stop working in your 30s, your portfolio will probably last for 30 years. And by that point, you'll bridge to Social Security. That's probably the worst case of the 4% safe withdrawal rate. Now let's focus on the good part. The 4% safe withdrawal rate has a success rate of roughly 80%. And out of that 80%, about 75 of those percentage points are going to be more money than you need. And what's happened for us is our investments have compounded faster than inflation. They've gone up much faster than our spending. And so although we started at a 4% safe withdrawal rate, today, 18 years later, if we were to start all over again, our actual withdrawal rate for our lifestyle would probably be about 25 to 3%. And the studies have confirmed that if you get to that point, you have more money than you need. And, and we don't mean simulations and probabilities. We mean it's going to be very difficult for you to spend all that money unless you start buying boats and airplanes. So that's the math. Now, the lifestyle is another issue. And human beings behave differently than the math and the logic. And so when you start withdrawing the 4% safe withdrawal rate, if a recession comes along, if a bear market tears into your money, for example, coronavirus, Right. <laughs> you're going to change your behavior. You're going to feel a little uncomfortable about spending all that money at all that 4%. And so you might quite naturally cut back on your spending a little bit. Another thing that happens when you start living the 4% safe withdrawal rate is that you've been making assumptions about your lifestyle before you reached financial independence on what the actual spending was going to be. The reality is you have time in your life to decide what's really important to you. And the first thing you do is you go over every line item in your spreadsheet. You call up your cable provider and make sure that's as much money as you have to spend. You go back and look at your insurance again and make sure that's optimal. You take a lot of stuff that you had outsourced in your life back into your life. And by that, I mean yard work, home improvement, cooking, whatever it may be that you had other people doing or that you were spending a lot of time giving money to other people to get done. Now you're probably going to do it yourself. You also get very good at travel hacking. And we found that travel, when you're financially independent and can do it any time of the year and don't have to go back to work after two weeks, becomes much cheaper. It's much easier to travel hack. You're much more flexible. My spouse and I, when we travel these days, we frequently do it on military aircraft or with rewards points on commercial aircraft. And we'll stay somewhere for a month or two months. We really enjoy being able to go out there and live like locals for a couple of months. All these things mean that you're sitting there trying to save for financial independence. That 4% safe withdrawal rate is a tripwire that says you're probably going to be okay. And then you just keep tweaking it from there on out. Mm, wow. I love that. Yeah, it's, it's very clear. And um, I love how it, when you said that, you know, when you're financially independent, travel actually becomes cheaper because you're more flexible. It's funny how the, the more finances you actually have, the more that everything else is even more affordable because again, yeah, you don't, exactly. you're, not, you're not constrained to a schedule. Oh, I have to travel at this time because it's the only time I could get off work. Mm -hmm. We joke about you don't have to live like a two week millionaire anymore. You can live like a local. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love it's that. Yeah. <laughs> and even probably in the way you, you choose to travel or like when you, when you're there, it's not like you, like the two week millionaire picture. It's not like, Oh, let me just, go get the most fancy dinner because I'm only here for a week. You know, you actually really get to almost be immersed in their culture and just really just get to live and enjoy it even more. So that's, that's exactly right. You'll rent an Airbnb for a month, which is a completely different rate than the daily rate you'll see on their website. And you'll find out where the local laundry gets done. You'll find where the local cafe is. You'll spend a lot more time on public transportation and walking around to all the local attractions and it's slower pace of life. We call it slow travel. 
because you're getting to look at one place very deep in. You're not racing all over the country trying to check off all the thousand places you should see before you die. <laughs> Um, and I have a more specific example of that. There was one time um, my ship repeatedly went over and over to the same port in Greece. And so we got to know that town pretty well. Yeah. And if you were the normal run of the mill tourist, you were probably spending up to $50 a meal. But because my ship had gone so frequently, I started to get to know the town. I was paying about 60 cents a meal because I knew where all the local grocery stores and where all the local what? markets were. And so it was a huge difference going from $50 all the way down to 60 cents just per day. Yep. Wow. That's, that's awesome. I was just about to ask you, like, what, what if you have, like, an experience of, you know, just kind of, like, living as a local and all that. What does uh, travel, like, with the family look like? Like, what's, like, some of your most fun things that you guys have done as a family traveling into these different places? I said we, Bangkok. Bangkok? Yeah, yeah really. Bangkok, Bangkok was good. Okay. Uh, right in my senior year of college, it was like, this is the last time we're going to have a family vacation before you start working. Yeah. And uh, we, we had three weeks in uh, Bangkok, Thailand, and we just stayed right in Bangkok. That's all we did. Mm -hmm. And we would spend, it, it's hot in Bangkok, even in the winter. And yeah. so we would spend the early part of the morning, usually between seven in the morning and noon, just going about to all the different tourist attractions. That's when you would go to the palace and you would go to the market and you would go to all the different attractions. But then we would spend the hottest part of the afternoon in air conditioning. And that would be either hanging out at our Air Airbnb or we would go to one of the local malls. That's where you would get your, your $15 facials and your $20 massages and your $10 <laughs> manicures. Like It was a really good lifestyle. And because we were there for three weeks, I mean, we had all the time in the world. We could be that person that sat down on a bench in the middle of the palace and just watched the world go by because we didn't have to be anywhere. We didn't have to do anything right now. I should, I should point out that we did this before she started her senior year in college and was about to launch into the world. And she was also a midshipman on a Navy ROTC scholarship. And so this was a chance to show our daughter uh, a slightly sanitized version of what her deck division sailors would be doing once she was an officer when they were on Liberty in Bangkok. You know, you, you want to the sailors. You didn't warn me about my fellow officer. And I yeah, think the officers, that maybe, that's, yeah, yeah. maybe that's not so uh, life-enhancing either. Yeah. But yeah. it was just to show off all the things we enjoyed seeing and doing. Uh, my, my wife, Marge, had been on uh, duty in Bangkok for exercises with the Navy a number of times over the years. So we knew where in Bangkok we wanted to go and what we wanted to do. Uh, we practiced, for example, medical tourism, uh, the mm -hmm. hospital in Bangkok, Omrad Grad Hospital, is one of the top medical facilities in the world. And you go there essentially just for a physical exam, uh, but it's concierge care and it's only a few hundred dollars for an experience that would easily cost thousands of dollars in America. Mm -hmm. uh, and other things were, of course, the shopping is very good and enjoyable and you can see incredible sights and learn about the culture. And we're teaching essentially how to do liberty. And it worked out very well. I really enjoyed getting to know Carol as an adult mm -hmm. instead of having to be responsible for young Carol as we were traveling around. And there were some some intense discussions about where we were going to go and what we were going to do and oh, who yeah. had the right idea. But that's what you do when you travel as, as young adults. Generational differences. Yes. That too, yes. She yes. can now think for herself and she can make those choices. <laughs> she, had, she had some very firm opinions of the way things should go. Yes. But we all learned a lot. And when she was younger, we made all the usual trips. You know, we'd go to the neighbor islands in Hawaii or we'd make the pilgrimage to Disneyland. Uh, and those all went pretty much as they go for all families. What really caught on with me in financial independence was when we started going to uh, college towns and doing campus visits. Mm -hmm. And when you were in, you know, your sophomore and junior year in high school, those visits were a lot more interesting because, uh, again, you would talk about all of your options and trading life energy for money and what do you want to study and what kind of job do you want to get and what kind of college do you want to be in. And it was very interesting because uh, my wife and I had gone to a uh, service academy instead of a real college, as we say. And so when we were making this college tour, it was just like letting us loose in a candy store of our colleges of our own. And we began to realize, oh my gosh, there's this whole world of wonderful colleges out there. And here we were locked up at a service academy. <laughs> it was a very interesting trip. And it was nice to watch her learn what she wanted to do and gain the confidence to go do it. And, it, mm -hmm. and you did it. Mm -hmm. uh, you're drinking from a fire hose, but mm -hmm. I think you had a very good experience there. I did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, Let's, uh, I want to go back, uh, I think, to, to the last one after we kind of like tackled the 4% uh, savings rate, withdrawal rate, um, the, the assets, the assets that you were talking about and how, uh, what kind of um, income streams that you guys have that you have uh, generated over, over time that allows you to be able to, you know, do your financial independent living. 
Back, back in the 80s and 90s, uh, you were investing in mutual funds, and most of them were actively managed. There was this guy over at some company called Vanguard. His name was Jack Bogle, had a reputation as being kind of a weirdo, kind of zealous about low expense ratios. Nobody paid any attention to him because it wasn't going to work. But what we did learn in retrospect is that we could make every classic mistake of investing, chasing hot funds, active managers, paying high expense ratios. The thing that got us to financial independence was that high savings rate. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say that it doesn't matter what you invest in, but I will say that you don't have to beat yourself up for making mistakes along the way. Today, if I was starting over, we'd put all of our money in passively managed index funds, probably a total stock market index fund, especially today mm -hmm. uh, with the stock market turmoil we're going through yeah. Yeah. At, with a low expense ratio. And we just keep putting regular contributions in there, every paycheck, whatever the periodicity is. The point is to put it in autopilot. That way you don't have to keep thinking about it or worry about getting enough bandwidth while you're out in the middle of the ocean or in the middle there's, of the there's desert. There's no cell towers in the middle of the ocean. You, you have nothing. You can't, absolutely nothing. You can't call Fidelity and ask them to change your asset allocation when you're 10,000 miles away. Mm -hmm. So uh, other options would be uh, real estate. Uh, if you are interested in learning to be a landlord and manage investment real estate, then that's a very good way to reach financial independence. And it's a slightly different way. Instead of piling up cash to make the 4% safe withdrawal rate, that's 25 times your annual spending. That's the inverse of 4%. Instead of piling up all that cash for the 4% safe withdrawal rate, you're buying investment rental properties and using that cash flow to, to fund your spending. And that way you're living off the cash flow from your properties and you're probably saving and investing on the side in, in stocks and maybe bonds. But much of your cash flow comes from the rents that you have left over, your net operating income from your investment rental properties. So that's another way to do it. Uh, there's many different lifestyles. There's people that will reach enough money, enough assets to take a year of sabbatical and they'll take a little mini retirement and come back and be able to find a job, usually because they've got skills or because they're highly entrepreneurial. Uh, there are others who are freelancing their way to success and they're global nomads, they're digital nomads, they're mm -hmm. remote workers, and that works very well. In our case, uh, saving in the 80s and 90s, we piled up all those assets, invested them eventually in exchange traded funds with low expense ratios. And we've had a very aggressive asset allocation. It's always been at least 90% Inv invested in equities in the stock market. And the reason for that is because we had steady military pay and, and now a military pension. But that volatility has been you know, an interesting ride. You, you eventually learn to get accustomed to it. You find the asset allocation that not only makes sense mathematically, but also lets you sleep at night. And for those who are married, if you can't explain your asset allocation to your spouse during a bear market, then right. you don't have the right asset allocation yet. <laughs> But that's how we've invested. And we today have actually been less active every year. I'm coming up on 18 years of retirement. And I'd say that in the beginning, I was making market moves and asset allocation changes pretty frequently. Today, we only make one or two sales a year. Maybe we're moving our asset allocation into something that's got a lower expense ratio. Today, it's mostly thinking about our disability planning in the future and our estate planning. Wow. And to add on a comment to that, your only source of income in this whole process has really just been your military paycheck. The The rental properties, if I remember correctly, that didn't start until after 2000, after we had moved. And suddenly we had two houses and we had one that could become a, a rental income. Suddenly we've got income. Yeah. Suddenly you had income, but that wasn't until after you've achieved FI. I mean, right. you weren't retired yet, but you were already at financial independence. That's a very good point. When I retired in 2002, we did have a rental property that wasn't making any money and now it's got some cash flow to it. We knew that I was going to have a pension, although that was in jeopardy for a few years, but that panned out. Uh, we did not expect that my spouse would be able to finish her career in the Navy Reserve and earn eligibility for her pension a few years down the road. We knew, not, we knew none of that. All we had was a high savings rate and the assets and a 4% safe withdrawal rate with a lot of opportunities that might or might not pan out. And it's an interesting mindset because when you're working it's difficult because you're working, you're constantly at work or thinking about work and you don't really spend a lot of time for life planning. And it's easy to fall into an attitude of scarcity. You're concerned that if you get laid off that that's the last dollar you'll ever earn. You're worried about quitting your job because nobody will ever hire you. And all those fears tend to boil over into thinking that the assets, the resources, the opportunities you have are limited and finite and you have to take what you can get while you can get it. But 
after retiring and after living a financial independence lifestyle, you gradually make the transition to an attitude of abundance. There's opportunity everywhere. And part of that is the rise of the World Wide Web. Part of that is remote work. Part of that is being able to be a digital nomad or the gig economy or freelancers. But a lot of it is the attitude that you can go out there and be entrepreneurial. You have the time to invest in things that you passionately care about and make them work if there's something that you really want to make work. Better yet, you have the resources, the people, the contacts, the information out there to make it work for you and make it work out right. And that, that attitude is difficult to change over from scarcity to abundance. Uh, we've made that transition. So today we're still living off of the military pension and some dividend income from our investments and some rental property income, uh, assuming that the tenants haven't trashed the place or broken too many things that month. <laughs> however, however, it has been mostly from the pension because as we've found the things we enjoy doing in financial independence, our spending has not kept up with inflation. Our spending has actually been kind of flat compared to inflation over the last 18 years. If you get better at travel hacking, if you find the things you enjoy doing, Longboards are cheap. Surf wax is almost free. So we found a lifestyle that works for us and it's sustainable for life now. Mm -hmm. Wow. Did you, want, uh, did you have something to add, Carol? You, oh, yes. I was very shocked when you said you and mom had flown the Monterey on first class uh, seats. I was, I was <laughs> blown away because, you know, they're, they're used to military flights and they're used to, you know, riding coach and commercial flights. And mm -hmm. dad realized one day they're like, wait a minute, we have money. We're getting older. There's no point in, in trying to stuff ourselves in the coach anymore. Let's fly first class. I'm just like, oh, they actually did that. Well, you look like you have fairly big shoulders and you know how it feels to fly economy and uh, be yeah. squeezed in there. So that, that's the main motive for me wanting to fly with more room, at least, at least economy plus. The other thing that we realized is when we would fly on a red eye crammed into economy for anywhere from Oahu to the mainland, you'd end up spending another day recovering. Uh, yeah. You'd have to hole up the yeah. hotel and you needed extra sleep. Something would cause more expenses on both ends of that trip. Why not spend it on upgrading to a first class ticket? We also took a look at our spending. Uh, when we travel these days, we'll travel hack with uh, rewards points, credit card points. We'll travel hack with military space available flights. Uh, the military retirees are able to fly on cargo jets, essentially, whenever they have room left over for passengers, they'll take people. Uh, we joke about Space A being free because if you don't care where you go or when you'll get there, then you'll have a good time. And that's worked out quite well. So average means that once in a while we'll spring and pay full retail for a first class plane ticket. I'm, I'm actually looking at all the travel plans that have been disrupted by coronavirus and thinking that the airlines are really going to have some great sales on tickets here in the next few months. So we're looking at that as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was also wondering um, your viewpoint since you've been in the market for so long, when, when there is this dip and I feel like with the shutdown in China, it's going to have this ripple effect over the next probably year. Maybe, I don't know. We'll see how long this lasts, but um, just for, for people who are like, quote unquote, losing their minds for this, this dip. What is, what is your approach in this type of environment and with, with your investments and money and everything else? Well, Carol's got her story on that side too. But when I retired in 2002, we were only a couple of months away from the pit of the internet recession. And that led to some fairly intense discussions about asset allocation and spending. But we got through it and life got better and we watched our investments recover very quickly. Yeah. Until 2008. And then again, we uh, went through that recession and emotionally, it felt about the same. Uh, mathematically, logically, we knew we had enough assets. One uh, tactic that I recommend that all new financially independent people take is to put about two years of expenses in cash. Whatever you're spending annually, put two years of that in cash. That way, if you do happen to retire tomorrow and walk into a recession inspired by a coronavirus, for example, you'll have two years of living expenses available to you to spend before you have to start withdrawing from your investment, whatever your asset allocation is. And it's a, it's a way to deal with the sequence of returns risk. That's the technical term is that sequence of returns risk in the first decade. After that first decade, you don't have to worry about two years expenses in cash anymore, but that's one way to give yourself a little breathing room just in case you do worry about walking into that recession. Mm -hmm. uh, since 2008, uh, the stock market, of course, has gone up like crazy. And I'd say that since about 2012, everybody's been waiting for the party to end. Uh, there's nothing fundamentally affecting the American economy that can't be recovered from. This is nothing like 2008 that almost brought the financial infrastructure come crashing down. Mm -hmm. This is a bunch of temporary disruptions. But on top of that, I think 
all of us have been saying, this bull market can't last forever. And when it does end, I'm going to be the first person to race out the exit and cash out and take care of myself. And so everybody has been chasing themselves through the emergency exit of a very large stadium. And of course, it's not going very well. Mm -hmm. We will have disruptions. Uh, it's interesting watching what people realize has to be done to limit the spread of something like this. The first definition of a recession is you never saw it coming. I don't think anybody would have looked at coronavirus last year. Last year, we were all focused on British exit from the European Union, right. people defaulting on bonds, a crisis of the day. We never saw this one coming. And it's going to be probably very disruptive for the next six months as we all get a handle on it. But eventually, life will return to a new normal. Those who have had an asset allocation that they're comfortable with will enjoy the fruits of the recovery. Those who have panicked and sold out will have lost a lot of money on the sale and they'll lose a big opportunity to get back into the market. And everybody nods their heads at this, but it's very emotional. It's very upsetting to watch your savings just wither like that. And that's the hardest part. Uh, and I've got, as you might imagine, a lot of questions from my audience wondering what to do. Some of them are asking, hey, when should I go out and buy stuff? You know, this is great. Uh, yeah. Even that, uh, I'd advise caution. People that are thinking about selling or buying, I tell them, look at your asset allocation. Get that straight. Figure out your asset allocation for extra bonus points, be able to explain it to your spouse on an index card. But once you have that asset allocation figured out, then you'll answer all your own questions about what you should buy and sell because you'll respond to the changes in the assets as the market goes up and down. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, for, for me, from my perspective, what I don't understand about folks that are looking to get out of the market right now is that they're treating the stock market like it's the company Enron. And it's completely different things. You know, Enron was just one company. <laughs> things went really south really fast. People lost their pension because everything was mm -hmm. invested in that one company. But the stock market is not one company. It is hundreds and thousands of companies, depending on how you look at the stock market. If you're focused on just the United States, you're focused on the global economy, so on and so forth. Some things are going to go up and some things are going to go down. I mean, sure, coronavirus is probably killing the, the travel industry right now. But I mean, hey, look at all the Amazon trading. You can get your own respirator for <laughs> oh, 200 bucks now. I mean, there, there's going to be something going up and there's going to be something going down. And so when, when people say, you know, hey, the economy is bad, you should pull your money out. It's no, this is, as Warren Buffett said, this is the price of hamburger on sale. You got to buy more hamburger because eventually that price is going to go back up. So if you invest as much money as you can in the stock market now, you're going to see greater returns in the end when the stock market does, and it will go back up. As yeah. long as you're diversified, you'll be able to buy that. That's right. Just, can, just don't invest all your money in Enron. You'll be fine. Or Tesla. <laughs> or Tesla. Or maybe yeah. Amazon. Yeah. And Apple's been okay lately. But. Okay. We're thinking about that one. <laughs> yeah. What, what I'm really hearing is that you guys see opportunity where other people don't. You know, that's, I think that, that, that abundance mindset is very, very important because then you don't make, you don't make a uh, hurried decisions about anything because you, you, you see things from a different perspective. And I love that you guys, uh, you know, were like suggesting, suggesting that, you know, for those who are in the FI movement and, uh, you know, to, to save, uh, two years worth of, of cash to actually have that set aside. You know, we, we hear a lot about six month or nine month emergency savings to be set aside and to actually have two years. I mean, granted that may be hard for some, but, but for some who are in the FI movement and living financially independent to understand that if you do have that cash just stored away, if something like this happens, you don't have to access your money from, you know, your, your investment portfolio because you just have something that can ride you out until, until it gets better again. So I, I love that, that tip. I think that's, that's very, very important. That's, that's leveling up too. That's beyond the basic 4% safe withdrawal rate. And when I say two years expenses in cash, that's probably 8% of your asset allocation. The other 90% is probably still going to be in a diversified total stock market index fund passively managed with low expense ratios. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, what are you, I mean, you guys are doing such amazing things. And I know I want to touch on later again about your, um, the money savvy and how you're really trying to teach the new generation to be money savvy. Um, but I want to touch on what are you guys doing right now to be even more intentional about your growth and refining your growth? Because you guys are in a really awesome level, but obviously there's always more room for, for growth and expansion. I'm I'm just changing poopy diapers on my granddaughter. Right, maybe maybe yeah. you should take this question. 
that's so, amazing. That's really awesome to have that time to be able to do that and do it, you know. That's exactly right. <laughs> and, and trust me, mom and dad are very happy that grandma and grandpa are here as well. It's working out very nicely. That's it's awesome. awesome. How old is the baby? Uh, let's see. Today, she's seven and a half weeks old. What? <gasps> Congratulations. Yeah, she's, Congratulations. She's tiny. Yeah. From a poopy diaper perspective, she's so very much. productive. Yeah. 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 Uh, when it comes to what we're doing to intentionally grow, a lot of it is what dad mentioned when it comes to going back and reassessing what you're spending your money on. Uh, I switched out of active duty military into reserve duty, and all of a sudden I have a lot more time to start questioning things like, why do I have life insurance that I have? Why do I have the car insurance that I have? And start reducing those numbers. And then you also have time to start reading more about different kinds of interest rates. You know, Can I do more research into this kind of CD? Can I do more research into this kind of savings account? And I find myself more on Facebook because there's all these choose a five groups, for example, bigger pockets, money, um, all the different big names in the five world also have a lot of groups where you have time to actually read through all these questions in Facebook and read all the answers and go through all these resources that the more expert people are able to offer. Mm. So uh, touching on that a little bit, um, just for our listeners who want to kind of know what you're looking into. I know that, you know, some of these things are very subjective because, you know, again, investing is very emotional money is is always tied to emotions but what's your one of your favorite things that you've read so far as far as cds and high savings interest rate like what are the stuff that you look into that you may want to share to our audience uh, when it comes to uh, cds and high interest rates a lot of people are thinking oh fantastic high interest rate that means it's going to make a lot of money but a lot of people forget to look at the expense as well and so it's very easy to look at just the, 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 the ceiling and forget to check about the basement to make sure that there's nothing weird going on. Mm -hmm. And so you have to ensure that when you're looking at different kinds of investments, you're paying attention to that expense ratio. And you're also paying attention to the finer details about when and if you can withdraw that money. And mm -hmm. when you're aware of both the, the time and the percentages, your investments are much better. And you're, you're able to weather through the economy because you know exactly what you've gotten yourself into. Yeah. So it's, it's said that you can really only control three things with your investments. You can control the time that you have it in the market. You can control the amount of money you've invested in a market and you can control the expense ratio. Uh, and beyond that, it's all part of asset allocation and, and mm -hmm. time in a market. Yeah. I love that. I love that you look at it from a, a whole perspective. You know, it's not just about uh, looking at it from, Hey, what is the interest rate? You're really looking at it from, uh, you know, all the sides of the coin, the front end and the back end, and then the little edge of the coin. <laughs> I love exactly. that. Yeah. yeah. And I think for myself too, just learning that, um, the different fees that can get kind of snuck in, in the basement, like you said, uh, could totally kill the interest rate that you're showing on the front end. It's like, Oh, I've got an 8%. Oh, but I've got 3% in fees. And then I've got, you know, this, that, or the other. And then suddenly you're, losing money. <laughs> and, exactly. Yeah. I'll, I'll go for another example, uh, mm. cryptocurrency. Oh, and yes. Mm. Back, Take it away. Back, yeah. back when you would spend <laughs> cryptocurrency to go buy a pizza without realizing that you just spent what was going to be $10 million on a pizza, cryptocurrency looked like it was going to be the next big investment. And until you started digging into the details, and one of the details was that it wasn't quite clear that the market was big enough to be liquid. It was easy to buy cryptocurrency if you paid the right price. It was easy to watch that money grow. But when it came to selling, it was difficult to be able to sell the cryptocurrency and exchange it for actual cash that you could put into a savings account to live your life. And there are many, many stories of people trying to exit at the peak of the market, a few that made it, many that did not. The other thing that took a long time to become apparent with cryptocurrency was it's not really about the cryptocurrency. It's about blockchain technology. And so what we all thought immediately was a gold rush and get rich quick has actually turned out to be probably one of those fundamental changes to the way we do mathematics and databases since the World Wide Web was created. We might be looking at a generational large tech leap forward. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we're basically cryptocurrency in my mind is like Beanie Babies all over again. Right, right. You <laughs> might end up owning Beanie Babies, but on the other hand, the manufacturer of the Beanie Babies has done quite well if you own their stock. Exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. <laughs> That's a great analogy. I love that. Yeah. Beanie Babies. <laughs> we, we've had time to think about these things and to come up with good analogies. <laughs> While you're sitting uh, at a temple in Bangkok. Yes. Or, or exactly. waiting, for, waiting for the next wave and the surf lineup. Yes. Yeah, it was yeah. so yeah. fun. That's, That's, so all, That's so awesome. Uh, quickly, and that uh, hobby aspect of uh, surfing. You also, I, you do martial arts as well? Taekwondo, is that, well, is that the whole family situation or? That, that worked out quite well. Mm -hmm. you, you came into Taekwondo, I think friends of yours were doing Taekwondo. Right. And you started Taekwondo and I was that 
that parent sitting in the bleachers watching my daughter having more fun than I'd ever had with any sport that I'd ever done in my life. And I couldn't sit there and watch her do that. So we ended up doing Taekwondo together. Mm -hmm. I'll point out that uh, the advantage of martial arts is that they're one of the few activities where your children are legally entitled to kick you in the head. And Mm -hmm. vice versa. (laughs) And vice versa. Yeah. But it was a very powerful lesson in uh, discipline, in getting knocked down and getting back up and pursuing a goal. And we were doing it together. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and mom sat on the sidelines and was highly amused at the whole thing. But we all learned a lot of life lessons in that. And one of the proudest moments of my life was us taking the black belt test together. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, you carried me through oh, that. Wow. So I was very grateful for that. No but, problem. Here for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. And uh, <laughs> getting our black belts together. And that, that meant a lot. And I think it also meant a lot when you're put in your college application, when oh, you start yes. applying for scholarships, the fact that somebody tackled a project like getting that black belt and spent what, eight, nine years on it? Give or take. Yeah. yeah to get there. Uh, and it's also turned out to be quite a great activity. Uh, Taekwondo, we had a great coach. It doesn't really necessarily matter about the martial art as much as it matters about the coach and the instruction and the people right. you're training with. Mm-hmm. But we had to happen to fall into the right martial art with the right group of people. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, my knees at age 60, uh, I'm not in a position where I'm going to be able to uh, take that risk anymore. I had to give it up three years ago, mm-hmm. but I still miss it every day. There's some testosterone poisoned uh, atavistic instinct that really is satisfied by training Taekwondo that I really miss that. <laughs> That's awesome. That's good. Yeah. I, uh, the reason I asked, I, I started, I had a studio back East uh, in New York before we moved out to California for, for a while. And it's just, it's something I always, I love, but you're right. The, the lessons, the discipline, when I see that, like on a resume, if I'm looking to hire somebody or bring somebody on, it's like, cool. Cause you you know, that there's that discipline, that layered um, pursuit and that, that fight both, I mean, literal physical, but also the mental fight going through. Cause the, like black belt tests are no joke. You know, and <laughs> persistence in the face of adversity, right? Yes. Yeah. 100%. 100%. <laughs> you talked about uh, life lessons that you're learning throughout that, um, you know, pursuit in, in doing martial arts and taekwondo. Can you pinpoint one thing that you really value to this day that you learned from just doing that, um, you know, that hobby or that pursuit? Getting back up again, certainly. I think that was uh, one of the things that's always good to know is that you it's a natural part of fighting at some point you are going to fall down. And Mm -hmm. so the best way to prepare for that is just to be ready to get back up again. And Mm -hmm. you may fall down six or seven or 15 times in a match, depending on how intense the fighting is. But you, you learn that not necessarily to expect it, but you learn how to deal with it and to rise up to the challenge and literally get back up again every time. Mm, Like the stock market. (laughs) Yes. actually. Well, I learned at a, a, a different level, and I think this is because I've just started older and, and because I've been at it longer. But what I learned was when you first start out, you can't defend yourself. You don't know how to block. You don't know how to attack. You don't know how to do anything, and you have a very rough time learning. And as you get more advanced, you learn how to block. You learn how to attack, and you've gotten to a level of proficiency where you feel like you know what you're doing. But when you have truly mastered a martial art, you no longer need to block. mm mm-hmm never put yourself in a position where you have to defend yourself. You merely are able to do what you need to do without having to defend yourself because you're carrying initiative. There's a whole bunch of life metaphors in martial arts, but it did, it did become a lifestyle. And because of that, I began to reflect on lifelong health and taking care of myself and training and not overtraining and enjoying the competitions the competitions that are, are in martial arts, they're fun. You get to go out there and get medals and points and watch your, your, your kids succeed. But it's more about the lifestyle. And it's more about having the routine and showing up and training and testing yourself and pushing yourself. And, and those are the things I miss the most. Now, I can still try to replicate that on my own. I can still try to replicate that in surfing. But it's at a, a much less intense level. And if I was to go out in a mass today with my daughter, it would be a very brief match. <laughs> <laughs> it's been awesome. So I, played too, so. I, I love that. Um, I hear that you basically are the more that you know about something, right? You're able to put yourself in a place of advantage just because yes. you don't, you don't really need to, you don't need to prove anything that as far as like, you know, Oh, I know how to fight. I don't need to prove that I know how to fight. I can actually just, not fight <laughs> and know how to actually put myself in a in a more advantageous position it reminds me of my dad he always tells me <laughs> my dad he's so funny he's always, he always tells me if you 
because he also trained in martial arts, is, is he said, I know, how, I know how to defend myself, but if I see that someone is asking for trouble and, and nobody else is in danger where he needs to protect someone, he always says, take your slippers, put it in your, put it in your it's like the, the, the thong slippers, you know, put it in your like, fingers and run with it, just run. Yes. <laughs> That's literally That's exactly right. right. Yes. Yeah. He's like, just run the other direction if you see trouble happening, <laughs> don't even try to fight. So, so I love that, I love that analogy. So um, I want to tap into a little bit about um, your guys' uh, mission and uh, raising the next generation to be money savvy. I feel like that is a part of your guys' giving back into the community. Can you guys talk a little bit more about that? Well, do you want to start? Do you want me to start? Well, we joke about this from two perspectives. One of them is we're paying it forward uh, mm-hmm. for all those people that pulled my career out of the ashes when I was about to make a horrible mistake on a submarine or people who helped me along the way. And now I have a chance to pay that experience to the next group of people that come along that are interested in pursuing financial independence. So paying it forward, that's one big advantage. Uh, we have this conversation around the dinner table quite frequently about getting skills in managing larger and larger sums of money and getting more comfortable with uh, stock market volatility and other life surprises. And then we, we tell our adult daughter and, and our son-in-law that it's not about them. It's really about us because someday they're going to have to take care of our finances for us. And we want them to be comfortable doing that, not just comfortable with managing large sums of money, but also comfortably knowing what we have, what we plan to do with it, and how they should manage it while we're not able to, for whatever reason. Uh, We talk about estate planning, and the difference is that when you're doing estate planning, you're dead. You get the chance to make the setup before you die, but once you've done that, it's probably difficult to control anything that happens after that. What has been a more interesting problem for us a bigger challenge has been, knowing my ancestry, disability and planning for that. Knowing that someday I might not have the cognition to be able to take care of myself independently, let alone manage my finances, but knowing that I'll have someone like Carol and her husband to take over for us to be able to monitor things and make sure the spending gets done the way it needs to be done to take care of us for the rest of our lives. It seems better to learn how to manage those big sums of money when you're in your 20s and 30s and, and be able to carry that up through your life rather than to have perhaps millions of dollars dumped on you when you're in your 60s or 70s, back, back when it may not have any use in your life whatsoever. You may have already made your own fortune. Mm-hmm. And so we joke about it as getting a little of your inheritance now while you're in your 20s and 30s, while we're all still around to talk about it and explain how we want to handle that and be able to take care of us and our disability. Uh, I've written extensively on my blog about having to take care of my father's finances as he was... Uh, dealing with Alzheimer's before he passed away. And uh, we're not going to lay that load down on the next generation. And this time we really mean it. And we have a plan to avoid that. Much appreciated. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> and for me, it's, it's two aspects. It's one, I have a daughter myself. I want to make sure that she's also financially savvy. I want to make sure that she's able to take care of herself. And in addition to being able to take on the estate from mom and dad and recognizing that'll be my estate one day, and then it'll be hers to take care of and eventually her estate for her children to take care of and so on and so forth down the chain. You know, it's like that says, it's not just about the kids, it's about the whole family. Yeah. And one of the other things about, one of the most striking um, experiences I ever had was being in high school during the Great Recession in a state like Hawaii. Um, it got so bad one year that the state actually ran out of money and they couldn't afford to keep the school campus open for five days a week. They had something called furlough Fridays. They would shut down the campus every Friday because they couldn't afford the wages for the, the cleaners. They couldn't afford the electricity for the lights. They couldn't afford, you know, in some cases, the air conditioning. They just could not afford to keep the campus running. And, and I saw from the fact that no one had money how crippling it was to not have any money. Now we were literally losing our time in school because we weren't able to manage our assets because people didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. And so it was... We, we talk about choices a lot, but we also don't really talk about how limiting it is to not have money and how limiting it is to, to not understand finances. Because if you don't, then you become a slave to your own finances. Yeah. Yeah. That's really great. So you're basically, what you guys are doing is um, you're passing on generational wealth mm-hmm. uh, to your family but generational wealth in terms of also like knowledge and wisdom to anyone that can come in contact with what you guys are, are teaching. So that's amazing because you like, I'm just thinking about how being in that situation where 
you're in a city where um, they can't afford to keep the schools open, you know, and they have to have like that far little Fridays happening. And that's, that's really devastating. And not only devastating, uh, you know, as far as um, not having the finances, but like even on your morale, like it's mm-hmm. really, it makes it, there's so much that happens when your morale gets affected and the how, how people want, they can get down and then all of a sudden they make choices from, from that place of not having hope, you know? And so, so I love that you guys are really being uh, uh, proactive about teaching how to be money savvy and all that stuff. And obviously we can see it in your family. It's just, it's just beautiful to be able to witness a, a dad and a daughter, you know, be so, uh, on the same page. I mean, I'm sure you guys have your discussions, but you know what I mean? But for the most part. Yes. Taekwondo is part. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Part of this also grew out of going to uh, financial independence meetups. So you're, you're probably familiar with things like uh, Camp Mustache or Camp FI, mm-hmm. where people yeah. get together for a weekend and talk about reaching financial independence. And it became apparent during those meetups that that my wife and myself had launched our daughter from the nest and uh, she was succeeding. You know, she wasn't going to come back and live in our basement. And they wanted to know how that worked. Mm -hmm. And so I started getting those questions. How do you raise a family for financial independence? How do you transfer the skill to the next generation? And at first, when those questions came up a couple of years ago, uh, I pretty much was babbling uh, an answer that seemed that I'd never thought about it. I really didn't have any good answers. All my wife and I remember is that we had a fireball on our hands who was endlessly, yes, you, who was endlessly inquisitive and wanted to know things and wanted to do things. Hasn't changed much, no. We had to get out in front. We had to figure out some way to soak up all that boundless energy and that thirst for knowledge and teacher stuff. And so we started talking about the things that were important in our lives. And at the time, that was saving money for financial independence. Uh, We came back from uh, one of those conferences Uh, We were sitting around the dinner table with Carol and KJ. We were crashing at their place while we were waiting for the next conference to go to on our slow travel. And I said, a funny thing happened at the last Camp FI. I got that question again. And they (laughs) wanted to know what we did. And I babbled an answer. But, you know, Carol, do you have any memories of how we taught you financial independence? Oh, yeah, three quarters a week. Yes. Yeah. She said, oh, yeah, I've got a few. (laughs) Here they are. But that was a conversation where I started taking notes and another conversation where once again, my wife looked at me and said, you need to write that book. Mm. And that's how we started. Uh, it turns out that I had a very good co-author to carry me through and make, get this one all the way to the publishing stage. So that's worked out <laughs> very well for us. That's again, that's one of those experiences that I never saw coming. And I find it very fun, not just fulfilling, but fun to be able to work on a project like that with one of your adult children and uh, relive those memories and have those discussions and see how everything came together. Mm-hmm. And, and it's also one of those things that's sort of baffling. You know, a lot of us know about financial independence, but a lot of people start that journey in their 20s. It would be very interesting if you can start that journey earlier. You know, I, I opened my first Roth IRA at age 14. And even though I was barely making the minimum to be able to put into that, that's an extra, you know, I'm 27, that's 13 years of compounding interest just from that first year. Yep. And so I'm, I'm 27, I'm saying numbers that are double digits versus people who are just getting started and only doing three or four or five or six years. Yeah. And on top of that, it, it's baffling how money seems like such a taboo topic that we don't talk about it until people are adults. It's, it's one of those things where it really should be discussed as children because it's, it's that simple when you know how to use it correctly. Mm-hmm. But there's something about mm-hmm. waiting until it's adulthood that it has to be so mysterious and, and shrouded that you can't figure it out until you're an adult. But when you get there, it's really not that hard at all. Yeah. And as an adult, we already have ingrained habits and mindsets that are very hard to break. <laughs> and student loans. Yes. And student loans. And, and student car, loans. car loans. Car loans, And yes. credit card and, debt. Uh, yeah. the, the, number, the number of times I had a sailor that came in and said, yeah, I joined the Navy because I had somewhere between ten and $15,000 in credit card debt and student loans that I needed to pay off. And wow. you know, they, it, it, there's, there's, on the flip side, you know, both of us have gone through the transition classes where dad saw folks that were transitioning out of their first career into their second career. And for me, I was in a class that was designed for the folks that weren't retiring. They were just separating, which meant they had done one or two enlistments, maybe five or 10 years, and then they were getting out. And they had joined the military to help pay down their debt, you know, their car loan, their credit card loan, whatever it happened to be. But then they were also exiting the military with credit card loans and car loans and and, and (laughs) nothing, nothing had changed. Nothing had changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Um, it's, it's just, so I, I love it. I, I'm so, 
it's it's just so exciting to see a family that is so passionate about it and just really making a change in in whatever way you guys can do. I mean, obviously, there's there's so many people that don't know still about this, even mm-hmm. though there are so much that is happening around the world as far as the FI FI movement is is concerned. But still, there is still a need to really educate people from a young age, starting from a young age, to know and understand what to do with their finances. And you guys are doing that, and not only individually but as a family which I think is even more powerful. Not not to say that if you are only an individual doing this, it's not powerful. I'm just saying that there's there's something to being a family and how that impacts people from around the world who can, who get across your message and you guys your guys' book that just speaks so much more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So thank and, you for that. And and one of the things people never encounter, never expect is how their family members can affect their finances. You know, we, we've been talking a lot about how you as parents are making sure that I am able to take care of you. But a lot of families don't talk about that. A lot of times you have 60 or 70 year old parents and then you have their children that are in their 30s and 40s that are taking care of their children. But then they have to turn around and they have to take care of their aging parents as well. And, and it's one of those things where it's, again, money is so taboo that even when they're adults, they're still not talking about it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sandwich generation. <laughs> we have, we have a lot of we have a lot of stories of both sides of the same situation like that as we were raising Carol, and we go into very intense detail in the book about what we did, why we did it, and how it worked out, and how Carol thought it was going to work out. Mm-hmm. And those stories are intended to give people not just a big picture. Yeah, this is important. This is something you should focus on. But literally, when you're going to start giving your kid an allowance and when you're going to give them uh, money for doing jobs and when they're going to get their, we go into all the details. We, we talk about what was a miserable failure as well as what was a success. And I, I hope that that gives other families the inspiration that they want to apply for their own family and how to make this work. Yeah. Wow. Well, Wow, so much. It's it's amazing. We're actually like there's even so much more to unpack and I'm I really, really value you guys' time. Um we want to now get into kind of like your own, we we could do it as a team or we could do it individually, uh, but your own three actionable tips that you would like to give to our audience to pursue their own version of a wildly wealthy life. Well, first one is to high savings rate. High savings rate. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's that's not just spending less, but that's earning more. Mm-hmm. Yes. And and the way you do that, the other the other tip is to once you've looked at your spending, you're going to cut out the waste. You're going to figure out what's important to you. You're going to figure out what you're willing to trade your life energy to work for. Uh, maybe that Corvette, uh, that F one fifty pickup truck doesn't seem quite as, as important when it's translated into five extra years in a workplace. Mm-hmm. And the third tip is uh, just invest as much as you can in passive index funds with low expense ratios. Gotcha. Thank Great. you. That's awesome. Did you have anything for that? Or, that? or that was your team answer? That's pretty much the team answer. Okay, right there. Perfect. <laughs> you guys are on the same page. Look at that. <laughs> I love it's, that. It's working. It's worked for one generation and it's working for another. And pretty soon it's going to start working for a third one. Fingers yeah. crossed. That's awesome. awesome. Maybe we'll have a podcast like 20 years from now and we'll have the granddaughter. <laughs> it could happen. It could happen. We'll, we'll circle back in 20 years from yes. now. Yes. <laughs> Episode 3029. Yes. Right. <laughs> That's amazing. All right. Well, we're on our way to our quick 10 rapid fire questions. These are okay. questions that we ask all our guests. Um, they, some of them are related to our podcast theme and some of them are just things that we want to know about our guests. Uh, say the first thing that comes to your mind, don't censor yourself and we'll do one, like question number one to you. And then what, what question number one to you as well. Right. Okay. So number one, if you could choose one book to live by, what would it be? Yeah, uh, that's your money, your life. Okay. Vicky Robbins. Okay. For me, it would be the millionaire next door. Millionaire next door. All right. Yeah, we have both of this uh, here. Personal, <laughs> sorry, <go ahead. laughs> uh, personal hero, living or deceased, uh, someone you know or don't know. Ooh. Say that question again. Personal hero. Personal hero. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Living or deceased. I, I'd have to say that Warren Buffett is a personal hero, not just for all the investment successes he's had in his life, but for all the miserable things that happened to him as a child that he's overcome in his life to succeed as much as he has today. I've read his biography. It was very powerful. Wow. Awesome. And, and for me, it's not a particular person. It's the FI community in general for normalizing something that's so abnormal. 
you know, when, when you're a weird person, it's nice to have a, <laughs> it's nice to have a crowd sometimes. You want to find a fellow weirdos. <laughs> yes, <here>. exactly. <laughs> yes, weirdos, money nerds, weirdos unite. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. uh, number three, the one thing you intentionally have to do every single day. I have to uh, watch what I eat. Mm, yeah, that's generational too. Me too. This, this is a long-term goal and it's uh, defined by tracking your calories, not just your expenses. <laughs> and same for you, Carol. Exactly. And it's one of those things where, you know, you, you watch your parents age and you realize you're going to be doing that yourself one day. And so you want to make sure that you're doing the right thing so that you don't age as well, even though it's going to happen. But you, you try to stave it off for as long as you can. Yeah. On, yeah. on a lighter side, the other thing that I do every day is I do check the surf forecast because that tells mm -hmm. me how the rest of my day is going to go. Nice. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, which may be the next answer, but uh, one hobby that brings you the most joy. Yep. Yep. For both? Surfing. Surfing. Yep. Nice. I miss it. I, love it. I haven't done it in a while. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Number five, most rewarding thing you've done for someone in need? Hmm. I'll go first on that. Yeah, one. you're gonna have to go first on that one. That was that was taking care of my father's finances when he got to the point where he could no longer in, live independently. Uh, we had my brother and I had to go in there and we divided up the duties. My brother was the caregiver of the guardian, and I was the guy managing the finances. I did that for almost seven years, uh, but that was probably the biggest impact on my life and, of course, on my father's life. Yeah. Um, for me, there's. Uh, you, you always want to find your relief in the military. You know that you're never going to be around forever. You always want to have someone else to take the next watch. And so for me, it's not just one person. It's all the people that I've been able to help take my job for me. You know, it's all the people that have gotten qualified and have been able to take over for me when it comes to being the ones that drive the ships, being the one that fights the ship, just being the one that takes care of my sailors. It, it's been rewarding to know that there's going to be someone after me and it's not going to end with me. Yeah, but that's the only way you could get six section duty, right? That's not, not that I'm bitter. Yeah. But yeah. Not, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know what that magical six section duty is where you only have to stand watch four hours a day and that's it. I right, don't know right. where that comes from. Like I've only either. ever, I've always stood at least six hours or more in a day. It's uh -huh. yeah. Here comes the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, no, number, number, six. number six is uh first movie quote that pops in your head. First movie quote that pops in your head. This comes up a lot. Looks like you're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> and that's the uh, character Roy Scheider played in the movie Jaws. Oh, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> I'm going to have a more childish perspective. Um, and because these daft and dewy-eyed dopes keep building up impossible hopes, impossible things are happening every day. Mm -hmm. And that's from Rogers and Hammerstein Cinderella. It's one of their lyrics. Wow, okay. that's, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, probably the most detailed or like, you know, answer we've gotten so far. Yeah, that's, that's, good. Good. that's, that's so much better than that's going to leave a mark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Missed it by that much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, is that me? Oh, number seven. Last big purchase you made for yourself. Ooh. Does baby count? I mean, technically, no. You're still paying for that I'm one. I'm still here. paying for that one, yeah. yeah. I'd say before that, the, the last biggest purchase that we had was um, we just bought a 2015 Toyota Prius, and we bought that in 2019. And so it's, you know, maintenance and upkeep of a car. That's really the, the biggest purchase that we have. Yeah. And ironically, I was going to say the same thing. We just got rid of our old Prius from 2005. Mm -hmm. uh, it had lived a long life, but it had nothing left for us. And we ended up buying a used Nissan Leaf. Uh, it was a couple of years old. And we, living in Hawaii, have a solar power array on top of our roof. And so we're able to recharge the batteries on the Leaf from the array. Oh, that's uh, so awesome. Fun. <laughs> yeah, that's a big, it's a big expense, but it's got a yeah. payback. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Uh, food you cannot live without. Oh. I've actually had to live without fruits and vegetables before. You you never realize how much you miss when when you're underway for four or five weeks and you can't four get, or five weeks. How oh, about ninety days? True, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you can't get fresh fruits or vegetables. You never realize how much you miss the healthy stuff. It, it's one of those things where you can only eat pop tarts so many times and they taste like cardboard. Like Ooh, that's yes. it. <laughs> and and also I'll add. Chocolate. Yes. Chocolate. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right, number nine, what is your spirit animal? Ooh, I would have to say an owl. An owl? I would definitely say an owl. That's a very good one, yeah. yeah. I, I don't have a spirit animal, but if I did, it would probably be a dolphin. Mm. Surfing. Yes. Yeah. yeah <laughs> they're the, uh, they're the, uh, the animals, the mammals that swim ahead of the submarine when you're on the surface. You're always seeing dolphins surfing the bow waves on a submarine. It's kind of nice to see that when you're out at sea. Oh, that's, that's so cool. fun. So you're in the water and she's in the air. 
Mm-hmm. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <Number> watch. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. Uh, all right. So number 10, the last one, uh, finish this sentence. If I'm stuck on an island or stuck on an island by myself, dot, dot, dot. I'm stuck on an island by myself. I hope there's surf. <laughs> <laughs> I'm worried about the surf. I'm worried about the food. Is there going to be anything to eat on that island? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. We'll let you know after we're surfing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it has all the rum gone. Uh-huh. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you guys. We really, really loved our time with you today. It's just so refreshing to see, you know, a family who are so passionate about financial independence, living it completely. Like you guys are inspiration to us, like Mm -hmm. really an inspiration to us. Thank you. To a lot, I'm sure. Um, Yeah, it's just amazing. Where can our audience find out more about you guys? And if there's anything that you would encourage our audience to kind of give into or serve into, what would that be? You can find me on the internet uh, by searching for Doug Nordman or for the blog for the first book I wrote, The Military Guide. And we talk a lot in there about getting the second book out, getting the Money Savvy Family book out. Mm -hmm. We have those websites and uh, the Facebook page for the Money Savvy Family coming soon. Uh, The book will be published in a couple of months. We're excited for that. Yeah. Uh, For me, I'm still working on bringing up the blog slash website slash the, the whole background to the book. And so in the meantime, the best place to reach me is just going to be on Facebook. I go by my name, Carol Pittner. So you'll be able to find me. All right. A lot yeah. of uh, yeah. Facebook financial groups, choose oh, yes. FI, bigger pockets, military financial groups. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the second question, where would you encourage our audience to kind of give into or serve into? Well, I would just start with the local community, um, as, especially when you don't know who your next door neighbor is. Sometimes it's easier to just start with the local community. And so it could be little things such as um, you're walking down the hallway in your apartment complex and the light is out, you know, actually put in the maintenance call to get that light fixed, little things like that. Nice. Awesome. I give all my writing revenue to a military friendly charities and one that has made the biggest impact for military families is Fisher House Foundation. I don't know if you have heard of them before, but they build houses around hospitals for families to stay at for free uh, while their loved one is in the hospital making a, a protracted fight against a disease or a recovery from a, a medical setback. That's wow, awesome. That's amazing. Thank you. Like we yeah. would love for our audience to look into that. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I guess this is it. We are done with our episode for this today. Is the saddest I've been about an episode eating. Or ending because yeah. you don't want it to end. Yeah, yeah. It's, been fun. <laughs> it's really been fun. We've... That, that all depends on whether or not you hit the record button before we started. Ooh, Ooh, don't say yeah. I, I just love that. I was like, oh my gosh, is there a minute? Recorded? <laughs> you're, you're, you're not the first that we've had that conversation <laughs> with. <laughs> yeah. We've probably made that mistake a few times ourselves. Uh-huh. So. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you guys for being yeah. with us. We love learning more about you, and uh, we'll look into your book once it comes out. Thanks, Sounds Jeff. good. Thank Thanks. you. Well, that was such a great episode with Doug and his daughter, Carol. I think that what I really, really love about it is just the father-daughter relationship when it comes to finances and really raising a daughter who is financially savvy. I think that that's just one of the things that I was missing growing up. Um, You know, my parents really, you know, they taught me how to save. They taught me how to be frugal with my money. But it was that. There was really nothing else, like, as far as, like, practical applications about money. And so... So I just love the connection between that. And now, you know, Carol is also very aware that she is going to raise her child to also be financially savvy. So it's just a very awesome generational um, knowledge of financial literacy that is being passed on over. And I really like just the idea that he's creating content and creating um, visuals and podcasts just for the next generation of military and different soldiers that are fighting veterans, giving them some purpose and direction when it comes to financing. Cause it's something that I think the, the current system isn't really providing. So it's really awesome that he's helping that huge community and thank you for your service for everything that you've done and for the soldiers out there that are still fighting. Thank you again for your service. And what I love is his, and his daughter's like passion for the military service and being able to bring financial awareness and different tools that new soldiers are going to be able to use with their own financial journeys. Cause uh, money is a, is a pitfall sometimes if you don't have the right 
knowledge and education, and they're providing some awesome tools to help uh, the future generations in the military family. So thank you guys again for your service uh, in both uh, the financial aspect and uh, the military service that you guys provided. Yeah. So next week we have Nick Loper. Nick is passionate about helping people earn money outside of their day job. He is an author. He is an online entrepreneur, and he is also the host of the award-winning Side Hustle Show podcast, which features new part-time business business ideas each week. So hope that you join us next week. And if you really love this show and you got impacted by it, make sure that you at least share it with one person that you think will also love it and hit that like and subscribe button and also rate us an iTunes. Tunes. Thank you and see you next week. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Wildly Wealthy Life. We hope that this episode has helped you take another step towards living fully, giving freely, and building a legacy that deeply impacts your community. We'd love to hear what you think about today's show. Please leave us a review or like us on iTunes and YouTube and click the subscribe button so you won't miss a show. You can also visit us at wildlywealthylife.com for today's show notes. See you on our next episode. Thank you and may you live a wildly wealthy life.